Podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Aaron. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories. But do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. This week, we continue our epic listener library series, featuring suggestions from you, our mysterious listeners. Way back in March, we received an email from Hubert in response to episode 36, The Sleep of Death, featuring a story from the series Cabin B-13 by John Dixon Carr. Just listen to this episode and enjoyed, like always, the discussion of its strengths and weaknesses. I was wondering if in the future you might listen to the version with Peter Lorre, the devil's saint from Suspense. Keep up the great work. John Dixon Carr is widely regarded as the Grand Master of the Locked Room Mystery. His stories often strain credulity, but that was half the fun. Christopher Fowler from The Independent wrote the following amazing description of Carr's work. Most of Carr's output possesses the graceful reliability of crafted clockwork. His writing is exotic, antiquarian, gruesome, and steeped in Gothic imagery, yet filled with a sense of Woodhousian slapstick. In addition to mystery novels, Carr had a long and successful career in radio. He wrote 22 episodes of Suspense, including the 1943 story Cabin B-13. The story proved so popular, it was broadcast twice on Suspense, once as a standalone broadcast, and used again for the debut episode of the BBC's Appointment with Fear. In 1948, CBS hired John Dixon Carr to write another anthology series, also titled Cabin B-13. All of the scripts for the Cabin B-13 series were written by Carr, including several scripts originally written for Suspense. One of those scripts was The Sleep of Death, performed five years earlier on Suspense as The Devil's Saint. It was the 25th episode of Suspense and featured a sinister performance from one of the Society's favorite performers, Mr. Peter Lorre. So what are we waiting for? Let's listen to The Devil's Saint by John Dixon Carr, first broadcast January 19th, 1943. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker, listen to the music, and listen to the voices. again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Peter Lorre, playing the part of the Hungarian Count Stefan Kahari, a gentleman of sinister aspect. The story is by John Dixon Carr, who calls it The Devil's Saint. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded in mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution till the last possible moment. And so, it is with The Devil's Saint and Mr. Peter Lorre's performance, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. The Devil's Saint. Paris. Fifteen years ago. Paris as it used to be. When lights twinkle from the old Trocadero to the hill of Sacre Coeur. When taxi cabs honk and the beat of tango swayed. And Chinese lanterns gleamed above the lake in the Bois. When, in short, you and I were young. Come then to the President's Ball at the Opera. St. Catherine's Day, 1927. A fancy dress ball at the opera, filling these marble halls with a multitude of masks and a multitude of dreams. The mosaic decorations are no less bright than the colors that weave here. Alecrins and Columbine, Cleopatra, and Musketeers. 
in the great marble foyer, remember it, they have set out little tables and lines of palms behind which you may sit screen. Look at one such table. A young man wearing the scarlet and gold uniform of an English guard officer in Wellington's day. A dark-haired young girl in the costume of the country. And as we approach... Yes, your face, you must... Well, why not? You really don't mind, do you? No, of course I don't mind, only you must Oh, Ned. Look here, Alona. We've got to settle this thing. You have enjoyed being here tonight, haven't you? Ned, I've loved it. After being cooped up at my uncle's place in the country, it's like heaven. All right. When I take you back to the hotel, I'm going to face this uncle of yours tonight. No. No, please don't. I'm going to say that you and I intend to get married, and that's that. I can't marry you, Ned. I've told you that. But why not? Just give me one good reason. Because I can't. My uncle, he would never allow it. Never. And that seems to you a good reason enough? Yes, Ned. This uncle of yours, uh, what's his name? Count Stefan Kohari. He's a Hungarian, I think he said. Yes, and so am I. My mother was an American. Well, what's he like, actually? Oh, he's a little eccentric. Mm-hmm. Oh, please don't misunderstand. He's a great scholar and a historian, only... He's a little strange. He... Ned. What is it? There he is now. Your uncle? Yes, that elegant man in plain evening clothes, with the order of the golden fleece across his chest. Oh, I see him. Oh, he looks as black as a thundercloud. He's throwing those two dressed as devils aside as though they didn't exist. Give me my mask quick before he sees it. No, Alona. Why not? We'd better face this out now. Sit still. Good evening, Alona. Good evening, Uncle Stefan. Uncle? May I present Edward Whiteford? How do you do, sir? How do you do? Ilona, do you think that costume is quite the thing to wear in public? Why not? Well, an older generation might call it immodest. It looks like... Like uh, what? Nothing. Will you go and get your cloak or your domino or whatever you wore here? Uncle, please don't make me go home so soon. It's hardly 11 o'clock. I was not asking you to go home, my dear. I was merely asking you to put on a wrap. All right, I'll get it. You stay and talk to Ned. I shall be delighted. Will you sit down, sir? Thank you. <laughs> you seem to have quite a gathering at this table. Oh, yes. Some friends of mine from the embassy, they're upstairs dancing now. <laughs> well, <laughs> look, glasses, glasses, and still more glasses. <laughs> you know, I was quite an addict once at uh, musical glasses. You ever tried it, young man? <laughs> well, it's very easy. You take a spoon like this, you see, and... <laughs> Like it? Well, forgive me, sir, but there's something I'd like to ask you. Yes? Well, I don't know exactly how to say this, so I'd better say it in the shortest way. I want to marry your niece. Well, you can't, sir. You smashed one of the glasses. A few francs will pay for that. But there are other things of higher value, at least to me. Oh, well, maybe I ought to mention first that my full name is Lord Edward Whiteford. My father is the Earl of Grey. Indeed. <laughs> so I only mention that to show where... Well, they're respectable enough. Well, the British ambassador will vouch for me, sir, if you would like to ring him up. And perhaps I ought to mention that uh, I've always kept Ilona carefully guarded from the world. Almost too carefully guarded, don't you see? That, Lord Edward, depends on my reasons. Sorry, sir. You have known Ilona about how long? Four days. Four days. You wouldn't even choose a business partner in four days. Yet to want to marry my Ilona after four days. Well, we know our own mind, sir. You do, huh? <laughs> then you know more than the wisest man in this world. However, uh, is one whose dearest wish is alone as happiness. Uh, I hope it is, Count Kahari. Do you doubt what I say? Oh, no, sir. <laughs> well, I will make you a proposition. <laughs> I own an estate in Turin, not far from Paris, sir. Uh, little chateau, a few hundred bakers, fishing... Very good stable of horses. I know. Lona told me. Oh, she did. Well, then here is my suggestion. Why not come down and visit us for a week or two? Oh, that's very decent of you, Oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> and uh, if at the end of that time you're not cured of this infatuation... Oh, it's not an infatuation. I swear it's not. No? Well, if at the end of that time you're not cured uh, permanently of this feeling, you may take it longer. And with my blessing, that's fair, isn't it? Oh, it's more than fair, Uncle Harry. 
don't know how to thank you. Oh, well, please, don't even try. <laughs> and at least I can promise you a very interesting experience. You see, at the Chateau d'Azé, there is one certain bedroom. We call it the tapestry room. Yes? Well, uh, I assure you, it'll be very interesting for you to sleep in that room. Why? Is it haunted or something? <laughs> no. No, 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 not haunted. <laughs> Well, now, if you don't mind, I shall say good night, and I hope I can trust you to bring Ilona safely to the hotel. Au revoir. Look over there. What is it, sir? Just look. Dreams of our fellow guests pouring down a main staircase. Shapes of nightmare. Shapes of delirium. Insane dead masks. Only the eyes move. Wouldn't we be terrified, perhaps? If he would look behind those goggles faces. Well, I don't think so. They're only ordinary people like ourselves. That sure is uh, where you make your mistake. Well, I shall expect you for the weekend and uh, encore in fun. Au revoir. All right, Lona. You can come out from behind those palms. What was he saying? I couldn't hear. Hey, Lona, it couldn't be better. Well, he's a very decent old boy, actually. And he's invited me to the Chateau d'Azé. Did he say anything about the tapestry room? Yes. He invited me to sleep there. And you said? I said I would, naturally. You mustn't do it, Ned. I won't let you do it. Why the devil not? Because everybody who sleeps in that room dies. Dies? Are you serious? Oh, Ned, please don't do it. Oh, nonsense. There are a lot of superstitions about every old house. This isn't a superstition, Ned. It happened once when I was a little girl. A man insisted on sleeping there. They found him dead in the morning. So? How did he die? They don't know. There wasn't a mark on his body. He wasn't shot or stabbed or strangled or poisoned or hurt in any way. He was just dead. Two nights later, in the province of France, now known as under Elaware, but once called Touraine, the ancient land beloved of Rabelais and Balzac. But now, as the wind moans down the valleys, and rain flickers across the apple trees and thunder stirs in those haunted hills. It can bring little comfort to a young man driven in an ancient carriage from the railway station along snake-like roads. To what destination? Ahead, a lift of lightning shows the gray walls and conical slate roof towers of a chateau set some distance back from the road. Lights shine from its narrow windows, dimly seen through the rain as... Driver! Coachman! Oui, monsieur. Is that the Chateau d'Azé at the head? Oui, monsieur. I will take you to the very door, if, sir. To what? Why do you cross yourself? If I am permitted. What should stop you? Only fear, monsieur. And I am not much afraid. What's that? Only the dogs, monsieur. They feed many dogs, large dogs. They see Chateau d'Azé. Well, here we are. Bonsoir, monsieur. And if I may be permitted to a word of advice, well, beware of the tapestry room. The bell on the door, there might at least be a knocker. Ah, got it. C'est alors, monsieur? Vous cherchez? Je cherche le château d'Azé. Et je. Uh, je. Uh, perhaps it would be better if you spoke English, yes? Yeah? My lord Edward Whitehall. Yes. Monsieur is expected. Please to enter. Which is at and cool. Thanks, so. Ned. Hello, Elona. Oh, God. The palm of the What the uncle? Oh, you better not kiss me, Ned. Madam Slay has to look out for my uncle. Mm. Madam Slay is our housekeeper. Oh. Well, where's your uncle now? In the drawing room. He's playing the piano. 
Come along. Hello, is anything wrong? Oh, everything's wrong. Two of my dogs were in horrible pain this afternoon. Dr. Solomon had to put them out with chloroform. Don't see them. I hope nobody's practicing. That's all. Well, here we are. Oh, nice tiger skins on the floor. I say, who's the little old man with the gray beard sitting over there by the fire? That's Dr. Solomon. <laughs> Doesn't he funny looking eyes? Watches and watches and watches. He's an old friend of the family. Come along, let's get this over with. Ah, Lord Edward. <laughs> well, I see my niece has anticipated me. Welcome to the Chateau des Hays. Thank you, Count Harry. Oh, you must be very wet after your long drive. Go up to the fire and warm yourself. Uh, uh, Madame Fay. Yes, monsieur. Uh, please tell Antoine to take our guest luggage up to the tapestry room. Yes. Tapestry room, monsieur? That is what I said, Madame Fay. Yes, monsieur. An <laughs> odd coincidence, Lord Edward. Dr. Solomon and I were just discussing the fate of the last person who slept in a tapestry room. This is not good, my friend. This is against my advice. <laughs> Against his advice. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon Crow. It is not good, I tell you. It is the wrong season of the moon. Uh, the wrong moon. <laughs> but there is no moon tonight. It's raining cats and dogs. Don't talk about dogs. Nevertheless, it is the wrong season of the moon. I say no more. Cheerful blunder, <laughs> that doctor. Don't do it, Ned. I won't be responsible if they make you do it. But uh, look here, Council Harry. What did happen to the last bloke who slept in the tapestry room? You mustn't call him a bloke, sir. He was a very saintly gentleman. The Bishop of Tours. That was some time ago when Delona was only 15 years old, but uh, surely she must remember it. I remember it. The church, said our bishop, has no use for superstitions. Well, <laughs> he insisted on sleeping there. I, I made it as comfortable for him as possible, but he was found dead next morning. With a crucifix still in his hand. Was it poison? There was no poison, monsieur. No. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon. It's true, Ned. Well, there were just two very curious things. You see, in uh, connection with that death, on a mantelpiece there was found burning a stick of incense. Just ordinary incense, nothing wrong with it. Yes, sir. And, uh,. Under the dressing table, the police found it with an empty jar of ointment. Now, here's your wits. A dead man, some burning incense, and an empty jar of ointment. What do you make of that? Oh, I don't make anything of it. It's crazy. Not speak like that. I'm sorry? It is still the wrong season of the moon. Well, what I really meant, sir, was this. Is, is there any reason for this story of death? A reason? Any legend attached to the room or anything like that? Yes, there is. Well, sir. Well, we are a very old family, Lord Edward. Old and perhaps accursed. When my ancestors moved from Hungary to France in the 17th century, they brought certain beliefs with them. The old religion. The old religion? Yes, the cult of Diana. The cult of Janus. The cult of freedom and fertility. The witch cult, if you prefer. Oh, now look here, sir. Must we talk about this? Well, you smile, but uh, when I say the word witch, you think of some humorous picture on a Halloween's card. It was very different in the Middle Ages, believe me. Then, my friend, there existed an organized religion which rivaled the church. There were many to worship unashamed at the Grand Sabbath. Many to receive all favors from Saturn, their master, and to dance forever, joyously in the red, flaming quadrilles of hell. Some 200 years ago, an ancestress of mine, Katerina Kohari, was tortured to death in a tapestry room for professing the old religion. Many persons have not thought it safe to sleep their sins. Are you answer? Oh, come, sir. This is some kind of elaborate joke. Hmm? Joke? The Bishop of Tours did not find it a joke. Not a mark on his body. I assure you as a physician 
Not the mark on his body. <laughs> no, not the mark on his body. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon. Yes, I get him. Well, understand me, Lord Edward, there's no compulsion in this. If you do wish to sleep in that room, all right? Oh, if you don't wish to I'm not afraid to sleep there, sir. Well, I thought perhaps you wanted to change your mind. Oh, never. Would you like me to make a wager on that? What sort of wager? Well, if I spend the night in this famous room and come out of it alive... Yes. Will you give your consent to the marriage immediately? Tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning? Why? Because I don't think the atmosphere of this house is good for a loner. What do you say? Will you do it? Very well, Lord Edward. I accept the terms of your wager. Don't do it, Ned. For the love of heaven, don't do it. <laughs> North Tower of the Chateau de Zay. Under the conical slate roof is the circular room hung with faded tapestries. These tapestries move slightly with uneasy, mimic life to the clamor of the storm outside. Candles burn along the mantelpiece and beside the great four poster bed. The flames of these candles waver too as the door opens. This is the tapestry room, monsieur. Thank you, Madam Fleck. That is the mantelpiece where the incense burns. That is the bed where Monsignor the Bishop died. Very inviting, isn't it? Will there be anything else Monsieur requires? Some sandwiches that he can't offer? Oh, no, thanks. I had a drink with the Count for Harry before I came upstairs. Dear Monsieur, uh, Monsieur's shaving water will be brought up in the morning. If he requires it. Good night. Trying to scare a fellow out of his wits just because... Oh, I hope they built a good fire anyway. Didn't realize how cold it was. Temperature must have dropped. What's that? It's me, Elona. May I come in? No, Elona. Get out of here. That's not very gallant of you. No, I mean, I, I don't want you exposed to whatever it is. Ned, listen. Are you going to bed? Or are you going to sit up all night? I'm going to sit up all night, naturally. Then... Let me sit up with you. No. Why not? Well, it may be dangerous. Besides, I promised your uncle I'd go through with this alone. I wish you hadn't had that drink with him. Why? He couldn't have done anything to it. It was you who poured it. Yes, that's true, only... <coughs> Is that... It sounds like footsteps. Yes, where's it coming from? Stay right here in the room. It seems to come from all directions. Doesn't it sound like somebody walking between the walls? Why, George, it is someone walking inside the wall. Get behind that tapestry, Lona. Quick. Hide there. Oh, come, Kohari. Where did you come from? Oh, forgive me, Lord Edward, for uh, seeming to appear out of the wall and between the tapestries. <laughs> like Mephisto appearing too far. And this red dressing gown perhaps adds to the effect, too. <laughs> How'd you get here? A passage between the walls? Yes, exactly. Don't devise my ancestors for visiting this room. You know, they invented that when its occupants were so unmanly as to bolt the door. The door's not bolted. You could have walked straight in. But I couldn't have done it unobserved. No. Maybe not. Have you had any other visitors, Lord Edward? No. Are you quite sure of that? Quite sure. Well, then, uh, since nobody saw me come here, I'll just sit down by the fire. <laughs> Please sit up with me. Is this the showdown, sir? Hmm? I don't understand. Well, there's got to be a showdown between us. Is that why you're here? Oh, I'm here, young man, to explain certain things to you. Uh, will you have a cigarette? Thank you. I... Oh. <laughs> That's perfectly all right. That is what you're afraid of? I'll have one, yes. A light? Go. Well, when I was discussing the witch cult a while ago, you didn't appear to think I meant what I said. Do you want a perfectly frank answer to that? Yes. I think you're mad enough to mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> mm. What you say in a sense is quite true. 
seen an old and uh, inbred family like ours, the mind can crack in the fantasies of witchcraft, become as real, well, more real than the living world. Let me give you an example. Go on. The saucer on the table beside you is Ming Porcelain. It was once owned by Katerina Kohari, a martyr of the old religion. Yet, you are using it as an ashtray. Oh, I beg of its lady's pardon. I'll blow off the ash. Oh, that's a very dangerous remark, sir. Don't you understand that the worship of evil can be strong and compelling as the worship of good? That the devil can have his saints too? That the sick brain which knows but can't help itself? You have profaned this room, you have bantering it. And therefore, you deserve to die. Like the Bishop of Tours? Exactly. You're not going to tell me the devil killed him. The devil's agent may be flesh and blood. Then it was murder. Oh, of course it was murder. Murder so cunningly contrived that no one ever saw through it. Go on. I asked you before to use your wits on this problem. Well, look, incense was burned in this room. Do you know why? Suppose you tell me. Well, obviously, I think to conceal something else, which would be too easily noticed. To conceal what? For instance, the smell of chloroform. Chloroform? Sure. Yes. A drug not really well understood by Lehman. Dr. Solomon, by the way, was using chloroform this afternoon to dispose of some dogs. So I've heard. Well, Dr. Solomon is old and uh, very forgetful. You mean chloroform could be stolen? Oh, yes, it could be easily. Now... Suppose, I mean, just suppose I take a pad saturated with chloroform. I place it over the mouth and nostrils of a man already sleeping or drugged so that he gets no air. Wait a minute. That, that won't do. Why not? Chloroform burns and blisters when it touches the skin. You leave marks. Oh, not at all, my friend. Not at all. If I first covered the mouth and nostrils with some substance like... Wait a minute. Uh, yes. Now you're waking up. Hi. Now observe what follows. In a few seconds, unconsciousness. In two minutes or three minutes, death. Certain death, yes. Oh, but chloroform, you see. <laughs> it evaporates very quickly. There is no trace in the stomach since nothing has been swallowed. Well, you lay your post-mortem for 24 hours. Very easy matter in these country districts. And no trace remains in the blood. Murder without a mark or a dead work. Murder without a mark. You can't do it, Count Kohani. There's one thing you're forgetting. What is that? I'm not sleeping and I'm not drugged. Oh, yes, you are. How? When? In the cigarette? Hmm? No. In a drink you had with me. What was it? Morphine. And you've had enough to put three men to sleep. Ah. See, that's it. Well, try to get up. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> you see? You've knocked over the fire irons. You'd have been in the fire yourself if I hadn't caught Take you. Take your hand off me. Just as you please. If I could reach that cell pool. Well, but you can't. Well, better sit down again. You murdering lunatic. So that's how you killed the Bishop of Tours. That's how you're going to kill me. Who, I? You don't think I killed the Bishop of Tours. Didn't you? You fool. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to save you. Dr. Solomon. Yes, Monsieur. Well, come out, come out. Come in the room. Come out and be my witness. Yes, Monsieur. I shall always guard the family honor. Even when I guess how men die. This young man evidently thinks I've been talking about myself. Am I in a popular parlance insane? Oh, Monsieur. Heaven forbid. I have never known a saner man. Have you any notion, Lord Edward, why I brought you to this house? You would never have believed me if I had merely told you. So I have to bring you here to show you. Show me what? What? <laughs> look, look at the tapestry. Come out of there. Come out of there. Hey, come out. Ilona. Yes. Yes, Ilona. Why do you think I've kept Ilona so well guarded from the world? Why, at a fancy dress ball, for instance, did I object to the costume of a medieval witch whose dogs were poisoned? 
so that chloroform should be brought. Who poured the drink drugged with morphine? In the devil's name, what are you trying to tell me? It was Ilona. <laughs> She's been helplessly, hopelessly insane for more than ten years. <laughs> Starring Peter Lorre. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday. Spear, the producer, John Deeks, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on The The Devil Saint from Suspense here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that was a continuation of our listener library series this summer, catching up on all of our uh, listener requests. And that came to us from Hubert. And I will tell you the exact moment when I went... Wait a minute. <laughs> I've heard this before somewhere. Because, you know, you guys just send them to me and I just listen to them and write notes. I'm like, and it was that moment where I went, oh, man, how many old time radio stories does some crazy guy play glasses? <laughs> 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 and then I went, hold on. And then I had to do my research. And then I went, oh, that was podcast 36 or whatever it was for Sleep of Death from Cabin B13. And then I felt even more dumb because that was one I brought to us. <laughs> it was one that I recommended. So anyway, I got all caught up and then headed into realizing that our analysis of this really doesn't become about the story as much as it becomes about how did this story differ from the Cabin B-13 mm-hmm. version. Mm-hmm. And now this Peter Lorre version is the original, right? This yes. is the first yes. one that went up. And so I'll say that, wow, does Peter Laurie make a difference in the setup for the ending mm-hmm. of this? Exactly. This it makes a huge thing difference. Hinges on this red herring casting of right. Peter Laurie, who uh, mm-hmm. you hear him and go, oh, he's the crazy man. Mm-hmm. So that twist is much more impactful than it mm-hmm. was in the Cabin B-13 because it not only do we recognize Peter Lorre as being that kind of character, but in his performance of it as well, because he's so yeah. sinister. And I will also say <laughs> that halfway through when I realized we'd heard this before, I'd forgotten the ending. <laughs> <laughs> so when we got to the point, this is, you know, Mr. Short-Term Memory, th- we get to the point where he's like, oh, no, she's crazy. I went, that's right. <laughs> So I got caught off guard again, and it was like a brand new story. And I was to tell this to you that, that every movie that I watch with my wife, mm-hmm. and I will say, wow, this is really good. She said, you've seen it. <laughs> Have I? They're always brand new to me. Always. And I may need to have something checked out. <laughs> yeah. 
I worked in a bookstore briefly in college, and it used to drive me crazy because people would come back to return books and go, oh, I got halfway through this and realized I've read this already. And I was like, how do you not remember a book you read? I have a journal in which I write down <laughs> all the books I've read. <laughs> or, so what? Don't you yeah. want to see read it again? Yeah. I told this in the podcast just, I don't know, a few episodes ago where you think that you've watched a movie and you have, but you think you know it and then you don't watch it because, well, I've seen it. It had been 20 years since I'd watched Casablanca. And you just don't because like, well, I've seen that a million times. And so you never throw it in. And there it was on television. And I watched it and realized how much I'd forgotten and how much I missed it and how beautiful it was. So... It's okay to see things or watch things or oh, yeah. listen to things again. And for me, it's always brand new. So this all caught me off guard. Well, so. I will say I think this is the superior version yeah. of the two stories. Yeah. I felt really mixed feelings toward the first version. I think the director, the actors, Bernard Herman with his music, everyone understood what kind of story this is is in this version. It is over the top. It's filled with ridiculous coincidence. Mm -hmm. And the performances reflect that. They're a little over the top, but they just pull you in. It also features one of the greatest moments in old-time radio, period. And that is Peter Lorre making fun of someone else's voice. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> over and over again. I yeah. liked the Cabin B-13 version better. Wow. Whoa. It was tough for me to listen to this because like, I just can't enjoy this the way I would if I didn't know how mm -hmm. it ends. But I feel like, and this is like the exact opposite of what I, the normal sort of comment I'd make, it, this was a little too pacey. It just sort of shot by some moments that I really enjoyed in the Cabin B-13 version. Like, like the playing the glasses. I feel like, and it might be just memory, like that went on for a bit in Cabin B-13 <laughs> before the, it finally broke and it. And I don't know if it did or not. We should go back and time it. But uh, <laughs> it struck me as funny when I heard it in the Cabin B-13. And I noted here that when Peter Lorre is talking and playing the glasses, it's somehow much more... Yep. Ominous to me. Um, yeah, I, I liked it because it was so eccentric. Like, yeah. Who is this weirdo? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> the glasses, I remember our remarks from that B13 episode, and it seemed ludicrous, ridiculous. And I think you're exactly right. When this version did it, it just seemed sinister. Mm -hmm. My problem with Cabin B13 in general, there was a review that I read from whenever the 40s or whatever, that, uh, just today, about Cabin B13. And the review took Cabin B-13 apart because it was all premised on a John Dixon Carr story on a ship. And then it was so successful, they gave him his own show and he called it Cabin B-13, but it didn't take place on a ship. It wasn't about being at sea. It had nothing to do with Cabin B-13 at all. And that always bugged me. <laughs> and that's why I picked it in the first place, because I thought it would be, oh, suspense horror stories, nautically based, you know. <laughs> uh, and that's what this uh, thing ripped it about. So I never really forgave them for when I first listened to this, because not I was like, boat. it's not on a boat. <laughs> so uh, you were able to let that baggage go for mm -hmm. suspense. <laughs> yeah, because they don't say suspense on a spaceship, but not really. <laughs> but I also felt yeah. the uh, the mystery was clearer, which it might just be I wasn't paying as close attention this time because I knew, but mm -hmm. of like the, the chloroforming and the how to mask the scent and da 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 da. Yeah, that's interesting because I felt it was clear here, but that might be because I already heard the story once, so it mm -hmm. could be that as well. It could be just my blind love for Peter Lorre. Peter Lorre makes everything better. Well, and I've certainly have been on the bandwagon of like, I haven't heard a wrong step from Suspense, which I know they're out there, but, mm -hmm. uh, and not that I did not enjoy this, I just liked the B13 one better. It was a performance that you yeah, like better? Well, like I say, this one had a really driving pace. Mm -hmm. which is normally, I think, a good thing. Right. But the uh, the B-13 was so eccentric and weird that it served the purpose of the plot, I think. It's hard for me to decide because I knew what was going... Well, I didn't know what was going to happen, obviously. <laughs> but I knew most of what was going to happen. I got caught off guard on the first one. And, I did too. and that twist ending. And I got caught off guard on this one, too. So let me think here. I don't know. Like, I, even the, the practicing on the dogs, I thought they just sort of shot by that this mm -hmm. time. That was more of a big deal in B-13. Mm -hmm. Whichever one we liked, I really enjoy Cars riding, this over-the-top yes. style. I mean, it's not my taste in everything. Yeah. It's not what I want all the time. But the just ridiculous 
gothic nature of it <laughs> yes. all. Um, the Howling Wolves, a crazed count, creepy house maid, a room that mysteriously kills its occupants. It's just like, could you cram any more cliches in there? But somehow... <laughs> in that mix it just really still uh, stays alive and fresh somehow and i'm not even sure how they do it and so i did kind of ascribe that to the performances in this version but you know it might just be Carr's script that he's able to take these wild and somewhat cliched ideas and, and make them fun the twist is beautiful and this one, when she's just behind the tapestries yep. cackling, yeah. and the sickening revelation is sinking into mm-hmm. Edward, it's, it's, it's a great moment. Well, it's his own fault for, you know, four days of dating someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a weird thing at the top where they say it's St. Catherine's Day, which I missed in the other version, if they even did. But there's a lot more intro in the, the suspense version. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what's St. Catherine's Day? Um, it doesn't really inform much but saint catherine is a, a martyr but uh, apparently in france on saint catherine's day uh france where this is said it is customary for unmarried women to pray for husbands and to honor women who have reached 25 years of age but have not married yet called <laughs> catherineettes and they will give them funny ridiculous hats to wear <laughs> to <laughs> entice gentlemen to <laughs> look at this ridiculous hat. I don't think that would go over so well anymore. No, probably, no, probably not. not. Um, I'm going to try to bring it back. I'm going to see what happens. But I was just curious because they mentioned, you know, that it's St. Catherine's Day, so I wondered if that had any significance. But I think outside of a woman who is unlikely to find a husband, then that might be the little hidden might idea the, that uh, uh, he's stuck in there. A little justification for why four days of like, yeah. Eh. She's probably That'll not do. picky. Yeah, I want to marry her before she gets a funny hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so true. <laughs> uh, and Edward's voice just amused me so much. That I'd like that would a lot. Dippy English voice. He sounded like Lord Peter Whimsy. Yeah. Uh, it was... But it's very similar to the B-13 version of that. Yeah. Very. Question, question for you guys, uh, just a suspense question um, that I get confused by. Different hosts, right? Mm-hmm. And I always get confused which ones the early ones. With the how early many ones ones are with the man, man in, in black. black. And, and I did some research on the man in black. And you know who that is? Eric's going to be so excited by who this is. Mason Adams. Uh, nope. Jo- <laughs> Joseph Kearns. It's oh, Mr. Mid- Wilson. It's Mr. Wilson. Oh, yeah. Yes. Also the voice of the doorknob in Disney's animated yeah. Alice in Wonderland. Wow. But mostly Mr. Wilson. The cantankerous next door neighbor. He yep. died during Dennis the Menace. Yep. There's about a hundred episodes of Joseph Kearns doing The Man in Black. And then it just fades and he continues doing the announcing for a while, but he just becomes this nameless generic announcer. But it adds this almost like a uh, whistler quality. Yeah. Um, because he goes from narrating to in the story describing what's going on. When I was listening to the intro and I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is different, you know, because I'm just waiting mm. for suspense, you know, and <laughs> dun, dun, uh, and I thought, oh, wait, wait, oh, right, this is that man in black, oh, and I get confused. Is this Johnny suspense. Cash? <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. And then I went back and listened to the opening again, and I realized, I really like it. Mm-hmm. I like that host. I wish they would never have lost that. I like mm-hmm. that whole format. Although yep. the guy that yells suspense is a better voice, <laughs> more uh, terrifying, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Joseph Kern's voice, was a, it's a little more high-pitched. Yeah. A little more doorknob-like. Yeah. (laughs) More like a doorknob and less of a teapot. I was curious about this episode particularly because we haven't discussed on a podcast a story we've already heard before. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's fun to figure out how do we talk about it or maybe Mm -hmm. we discover... We're not going to do this again <laughs> uh, right. because part of the discussion is sometimes the surprises of the story or, I mean, if we've heard it before, some of the fun is the reaction to someone else on the podcast who hasn't heard it before. And so I think this might be outside of like a major classic episode the first time we've discussed something that like yeah. not only have all of us heard, but we've already talked about. Well, obviously with me, though, it was all brand new. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> forgot about your memory issues. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that I'm really glad you didn't send a note in the email, you know, and saying, oh, by the way, this is a remake of this and or the original of this, and we've heard it before, because it was fun to discover that as I went on. And it was fun to poke fun at myself sitting there going, how many glass-playing freaks are there? <laughs> oh, wait. 
we should do this again and do a couple different versions of the day Sinatra got fat. <laughs> <laughs> and then compare and contrast. Oh, yeah, because, you know, suspense picked that. Uh, <laughs> X minus one's one. version's really different. <laughs> well, it's got happy music. <laughs> Countdown to fatness. <laughs> Fat minus one. <laughs> Well, I will say that I love this story in general, what Carr wrote. Uh, I think it's a fantastic story. Uh, I will have to say, Tim, that I, I, I like this one better oh, yeah. uh, just because of uh, Peter Lorre. That makes the setup to the reality of it uh, much more fun. That speech about the uh, various uh, party goers coming down the stairs. Yeah, that was like, like, yeah. Shapes of nightmare, <laughs> shapes of yeah. delirium. It's perfect for Laurie. Mm-hmm. But he was very understated, actually, throughout this entire mm-hmm. thing for Peter Laurie. I don't think he ever does a Peter Laurie freak out where he really No, screams. he never did. I mean, other than making fun of Dr. Solomon's French accent, that's about it. I'm not going to give it the classic, but it definitely stands a test of time. And again, I think suspense in our podcast works against itself because yeah. it's hard to keep saying every suspense is a classic. You've got to have some bar somewhere. So there's been other suspense episodes that I've liked better. So, But definitely a lot of fun. I agree. Stands the test of time for sure. Great fun to listen to. Peter Lorre, I could just listen to him read the phone book. Um, they don't make phone books anymore. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> they, read the internet <laughs> they do oh do they yeah they show up at my door and I'm wow like, i sense like, a tangent <laughs> close <laughs> close uh i also will call this a stance the test of time uh very much the same it's it's suspense so it's so good the cast is amazing the story is amazing I only vaguely have criticism in that the B-13 version to me was so indulgent and weird that I enjoyed that aspect of it more. You would have liked it if it was Vincent Price. I would have <laughs> loved it if it was Vincent Price. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. That came from Hubert, right? Yes. Thank you, Hubert. We appreciate it a lot. Tim, tell him something. Uh, please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. That's the website where this podcast is housed. If you go there, you can find other episodes of this podcast. You can also find information about live shows that we do, because we do do live shows. Do do. Um, <laughs> do do. You can find information about how to get a hold of us. If you have requests, you can... Uh, hold con- of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's only funny because Eric beat me to it. <laughs> I'm going to keep going on. You can, uh, there's information about how to get all of us on Facebook, and Instagram, and Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Uh, there's also a Twitter, contact Tim. form. Just you can get a hold of us. Oh, uh, hey, and if you want to support this podcast, please go to patreon.com slash the morals and you can become a member of the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society. There's some great rewards on there. Also, check out some of the Friends of the Society. There are other podcasts and fun stuff that we would like to uh, recommend to you guys if you're into old time radio. And finally, please. If you love the podcast, write us a review on iTunes, because it matters. It matters to us. Yes. Um, Why don't you do a different version of another review on there? (laughs) 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 Recycle the same review, but make it slightly different. Do it in the style of Peter Laurie, and we'll like it. Uh, This is a remake of OTR (laughs) Fanguy 77's review. (laughs) I'm great. Now he's going to be mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. <laughs> oh, actually, I wanted to also plug this, that coming up in September of 2018, uh, we're heading toward our 100th episode. Ooh, yes, we yes. are. And I thought maybe we should let them know what we're doing and why. Yes, we are going to be discussing the War of the Worlds. It's going to be a big, fat, double-sized podcast uh, and uh this is because we reached our first Patreon goal, and that was one of the rewards if we were going to reach 100. So that's really exciting, and uh, we thought it would be the perfect episode for our 100th mm-hmm. episode. All right. Uh, coming up next, it's, uh, well, my pick out of the listener requests, and I picked one from Lights Out called It Happened. Until then... Oh, it's very easy. You take a spoon like this, you see, and... <laughs>